This is Dhamma on air number three, and it's recorded the 12th December 2015. The first two Dhamma on airs was live uh, through Google Hangout, but my internet connection was too bad, uh, and I think the result of the recordings was technically uh, too lousy. So this time I have made a pre-recording and then upload it instead. And this I will continue with until my internet recording is better and until the issues of people watching their microphones making noise and so on, these issues also uh, have been solved. But uh, please uh, hang on, send in your questions during the week and then I will try to answer them every uh, Friday or Saturday and then uh, send out the hangout uh, or the Dhamma on air questions and answers question sessions every Sunday as far as possible the questions today are uh, three sent in by people uh, first is how to gain continuous unbroken mindfulness unbroken awareness so you're not distracted a question B is uh, please explain spiritual bliss super mundane joy versus a uh, simple sense pleasure joys of this world joys of the flesh and question C is how to control sexual desire and craving for porn but first the normal intro Namo Tasso Bhagavato Arahat Sama Sambuddhasa Worthy, honorable, and perfectly self enlightened is the blessed Buddha. And in Danish, you should repeat it in your language a very fullständig, complete, a perfect, self abused, and the same Buddha. Okay, question A How to gain continuous mindfulness we just define mindfulness what is mindfulness this is important to understand in the Buddhist sense mindfulness is two things not one thing the current uh, thing in management and uh, commercial versions of mindfulness in the New Age society and uh, in the yoga society is that it's present awareness awareness of the present moment awareness of what is happening here and now that's also true but that's only one component that's the first component very important awareness of the, what is inside awareness of what is outside then number two is mindfulness of what happened a long time ago and thereby also mindfulness of the four noble truths you have learned a long time ago and everything that you have learned a long time ago not only in this life but in all your prior lives trying to remember that in the very moment because that will influence behavior which will influence karma which will influence future your future the answers to this how to establish it can say for example normal awareness if you say this is one second uh, of of consciousness how much aware are you actually yeah, let's, if we say there's one billion Dhamma state, it's probably more than one billion. It's probably a hundred billion or more than that. But then there will be awareness, just a few percent of these uh, discrete states in this one second. So actually, most of the time you're not aware of what you're doing, what you're thinking. You're on autopilot. And that's the problem, because the autopilot can solve certain things it can respond, for example, if you burn your fingers, you will retract your hand. If you see something pleasurable, you run towards that. Whether it's food or sex or money, autopilot runs. Right? So it can solve some problems, but it, it cannot solve everything. And it's not, it's not the foolproof principle, the monkey mind, autopilot. Right? So also goes with autopilots in planes today. They cannot land a plane by themselves you have still have to have a pilot your pilot is your mindfulness 
It's also your guide. It's also your map. It's also your doctor. It's necessary for you to gain a pleasant future, not fall into unpleasant, painful, fearful states of Baya. Neither now, nor later in this life, nor in particular at the moment of death. Crucial. So, uh, how to establish that? That's actually not, not so easy, actually. But uh, until, let's say, this is uh, one second again, uh, you have this one second, then you see that instead of being aware, let's say 1% or 3% of, of these 100 billion Dhamma discrete states of consciousness, then it will increase to 27% spread out over the whole second time, huh? and then 55%. 80%. 80%, then you're, you're really, really doing good if you can hold on for, for minutes, hours, continuously. Because then you, you're sampling reality, both the internal mental reality and the external physical reality and other beings' mental reality. You're sampling that with great accuracy, with 80% accuracy. And thereby you can respond to it huh? accurately. If you're not sampling, if you're not recording what's going on, then you have no chance of taking it into calculation how these states should be uh, reacted upon in an advantageous kusala manner. No chance. Huh? So first one has to sample, sample data, what's going on. And then one can react, reflect and then react. So awareness of the present activity uh, is the first thing. What does it mean by present activity? For example, if you sit on the toilet, you sit on the toilet, you notice that you're sitting on the toilet. You, you, and you label it, and you always label it twice. Sitting on toilet, sitting on toilet. If you're eating, you're eating. If you're swallowing, you say swallowing, swallowing. Tasting, tasting. Touching, touching. Lifting, lifting. Clinching, clinching. Hearing, hearing, seeing, seeing, thinking, thinking. Talking, talking. Whatever you do, you notice it and label it. So you are kind of like stamping in it into your mind. Over a long time presence, wherever you are, wherever you are, whatever you're doing in your lay life, not only on the pillow, wherever you are, you just do this. You're labeling the present activity. Lifting hand, lifting hand. Putting down hand, putting down hand. Walking forward, walking backward. Then another, so this is of, of the awareness of the present activity. Whatever it may be. Mental or physical, internal or external. Whatever it may be, you label it and you label it twice inside your head. Hearing, hearing. Thinking, thinking. Understanding, understanding. Then there's awareness of what's going on externally. This should try to uh, establish not only what is going on, what you see in front of you, but also what's going on in the back and to these two sides, both sides. So imagine you're a blind person. A blind person is very, very good to having awareness, intuition present all over around. So it's not only, you, you try to establish not only awareness in the front, in the visual field, that's a common thing. Huh? Uh, but even people can go because they're so absorbed into their own monkey mind speculations and worries and regrets and what have you, that they don't, what they see, even what they see with their eyes, they don't see with their mind. They don't notice it because there's no awareness, no mindfulness, no sati. Sati is a Pali word for, for mindfulness, awareness. I think awareness is a better, a better word because mindful, if mind is full and a ness of that is, doesn't sound good to me. If your mind is full, it's better than mind is empty and it's still. If mind is full, very busy, then usually it cannot cope. It, there's too much flowing of data. So, the first thing is train this 
awareness of present activity, labeling, labeling, and 360 degree surrounding what is going on, what is behind me. Is it a dog or a tree or a car or my wife or the, the refrigerator or whatever? Huh? And then this present activity, what I'm doing, I'm on the toilet, I'm shoveling snow, I'm on my way to the shop or in the car, am I driving or what? Driving, driving, stopping, stopping. Huh? A driving can be very good, very, very good training. Huh? Seeing red light, seeing red light. Car coming left, car coming left. Truck, truck, so on. Then there's, this. this two can be practiced everywhere. Then there's a, another issue is awareness of the four postures. This is also a classic. So whenever you're sitting, now I'm sitting, you say to yourself, sitting, sitting. When you're lying down, you notice to yourself, lying down, lying down. Standing up, you notice, ah, this body's standing up. Walking, this body's walking. So this is a typical four postures. Running, you can say, ah, this body's running. Whatever this body does, stretching an arm, stretching an arm. Pulling arm back, pulling arm back. Put, sitting foot forward while walking, sitting foot forward. Labeling, labeling, labeling. Thereby, you increase the amount of sampling and the amount of presence of your mind. Regard what actually is happening, physically speaking and mentally speaking, right now, right here for you. Huh? That's awareness. So you are increasing the sampling by labeling, 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 huh? noticing, labeling, noticing, labeling. Noticing is one thing, but if you don't label, you don't remember it. Huh? And how can you remember what happened long time ago that was, remember that was the second important aspect of mindfulness? How can you remember if you haven't sampled it? Huh? If, there, if there's nothing on the database, you cannot record it. There's nothing. Then there's no recording to find. There's no file. There's no. There's nothing there. So then you can't remember. You can't remember it. First, you have to sample it, and then remember it. Sample it is the awareness. Labeling, labeling, remember it. Then you transfer it from short-term memory to long-term memory. Labeling, labeling. Important. So, this was something. Awareness of the four postures, awareness of the present activity, and awareness of 360 degree. What is there in my surroundings? 360 degree surroundings. This is something you can do all time long, and it is free free training. <laughs> you can do it outside the pillow in the late life on the job uh, while having sex, while going to bath, uh, while going to the toilet while digging in the garden, wherever, where, whatever you are doing, you can, you can use these th three issues. Again, awareness of the present activity, noticing, labeling, awareness of 360 degree surroundings, and awareness of the four postures. Always good, always good to practice. Then there's uh, some special points also. While sitting on the pillow and you're doing uh, Anapanasati, breathing meditation, which I can re recommend very strongly, which is a, a classical method to establish mindfulness. There's a kind of like a classic uh, or semi-classic uh, intro to, to this method. Before you start on the 16 points of orthodox breathing meditation, there's two, the ancient elders, they gave two methods of exercises to do before you actually start breathing before you you know you you focus your breath on on the nostrils and start repeating the 16 steps these two preliminaries goes under the heading of counting and connecting so you count like this uh, breathing in one breathing out one one so one one two two Three, three, four, four, five, five, six, six, 
seven, seven, eight, eight, nine, nine, ten, ten. If you go more than further than ten, you, you count eleven, you have to start all over again. You count to three, you count to ten, three times. That's a classic. Sometimes you can find yourself counting up 31, 32. So you're, you, then your mind is somewhere else. You're counting, you're, you're, it means that you're counting on autopilot. It's a monkey mind that is counting. And you're thinking some, something else about your economy or love affair or whatever. So, so you have to realize that I, I went far, far, far beyond 10. Back to square one. You always go back to start of the three sequences. You have to do three completely perfect countings before you proceed to the next step, which is called connecting. Notice here, when you're breathing one, one, you have here, when you count in, there's mindfulness of the breath. One, because you have to stop here. Then there's also mindfulness down slope. Then there's two places where there's no mindfulness. And that is up here on the top and down there. So this you have to connect now. So that, be, that should ideally be continuous awareness on all the stages of the breathing. Unbroken. Not even for a split second are you unaware of what's going on. Not even for a billionth of a second. Not even for a billionth of a billionth of a second. Ideally. Not even for one Planck moment, that is 10 to the minus 5 of 43 seconds, are you aware of what is going on? You see this Planck moment arise, you see this Planck moment cease, just as it is. That's the end stage of it. It takes practice, but you, one can just expand one's resolution of mindfulness gradually. And that's very extremely advantageous. So. Now we had this one, one. We had awareness of where we're counting in and counting out, but not in the middle and not in between the breath. So now we, we start with connecting. There you, you count like this. One, two. Because you say one, two instead of one, one, you, st you have to be aware up here, up here also. In between the in breath. One, two, out breath. And because you say two here, then you have to say three, four. Three, four. Four, five. Five, six. Six, seven. Because you have to remember down here that you have to step up one. So five, six. Six, seven. So you have to be aware of those in, in the bottom. huh? Again, you, you, you take out like this. One, two. Two, three. Three, four. Four, five. And so on. Up to ten. Start over with one again. And then up to ten again. Up to ten three times. If you miss out on one, or you cannot remember where you got back to square one, start over all over again. If you miss, if you go up to 11, 12, and so on, back to square one, start all over again. It takes time to learn, actually. Some can do it right away. Some can, can try for months without succeeding. So it's a good lesson to learn. Where is my mindfulness here in this mindfulness game? How mindful am I? Do I have to use three years to learn to count to 10 three times? while watching my breath, or what? So it's a good measure on where one is in, regarding this mindfulness, which is the intro, because you cannot purify behavior, or purify mind, or purify thinking, if you have no mindfulness. Because you're basically not seeing what, not and thereby not knowing what's going on, mentally speaking, and with your own behavior, and what the factors, conditioning factors, which is flowing in on you, what they mean for, for your behavior, how, how they condition, condition and influence your behavior, which then influence your future, because it's your form and karma, intentional behavior at any moment.
that will create a particular specific future according to the ethical value of the behavior of the present. So this was the third answer to this continuous awareness. And there's a fourth, and this is the eight stages during walking meditation. Walking up and down is a classic Buddhist training. And there you you try to establish uh, eight stages. Intention to lift food. Lifting food. Foot now up. That's the third stage. Intention to push the foot forward. Pushing foot forward. The intention to set foot down. Setting the foot down. Foot touching the ground. And then A again. Intention to lift foot. So here, note that you are, you are shifting between two kinds of awareness. The intention and content, intention to lift foot, which, com- which comes right before lifting the foot. Intention to push the f- foot forward, which comes right before pushing the foot forward. Intention to put the feet down, then putting the feet down. Putting the feet down in some, is some physical aspect. You're, you're putting some awareness down. Where is the foot? Is it going down, up or down, or what? It's a physical state. It's a movement. Watching the intention is a mental aspect. So you're shifting quickly. While moving one step, you're sh- changing four times that you have eight stages of awareness. In one single step with one foot, you try to establish eight stages of what this foot is doing. When it goes up, moves forward, puts down. This is a good practice, huh? You can later on you can expand it, but but just if you can come up to these eight stages, you're really well off. You're very close. Then you can easily go further on by yourself. So again, intention to lift foot, lifting foot, intention to push forward pushing forward, intending to put down, putting down, foot touching ground, eight stages of moving the foot. This more or less covers the ground of the practical, pragmatic issues of how to establish continuous mindfulness. Sariputta always taught the, the monks up to the stage where the mindfulness was uh, established. When I mean mindfulness is established, this means that you're actually sampling all these 100 billion plant moments in, in each second, all of them. Then there's 100% sampling of all internal mental states and all external physical state during that second. Then you're safe because now you have the data in the database. Now we can start remembering and working with it and uh, analyzing it and see what comes out of it. But before the data is in the database, no chance. Huh? The question B is, explain bliss and the highest happiness in this world uh, versus sense pleasure and uh, levels of, of this bliss, of this pleasure. Yes, there's uh, various kinds. You can say in, in Buddhist philosophy, you, you, you just say there's two kinds, and it's important to to discriminate between these two. There's one that is mundane sense pleasure, is pleasures of this world, is seeing something that's induced pleasure. It can be sexual forms, it can be art, any kind of visual combination of form and color that induce pleasure. The sense pleasure by, by the eye, Hearing music, sense pleasure by the ear, smelling perfume, sense pleasure by the nose, S- tasting uh, soft eyes, sense pleasure by the tongue, uh, sexual touch, uh, or any kind of pleasant touch, for example, having clothes on that is giving you a warm feeling on your body, uh, tactile uh, sense pleasure. And then uh, sense pleasure, for example, by being drugged or being drunk. Uh, mental sense pleasure. So you are experiencing a mental state that induces pleasure. Important in our days, unfortunately. This we call joys of the flesh because it's connected with the body. The body is used as a receptor, as a sensor 
to get this joys of the flesh, samisa. Then there's some other joys which is not of the flesh, niramisa. Amisa, flesh, samisa, with flesh, joys of the flesh. Niramisa, without flesh. Joys not of this body, not of this world. Super mundane, above this world. So there's this, uh, the last one is of course the highest and the most sublime. And that's basically why the hedonist uh, idea of sense pleasure, simple sense pleasure, is the highest happiness. That's actually not true. That's a false idea. And that's what people make people running. It's just sense pleasure. Huh? They run for sense pleasure. So uh, simple sense pleasure, samisa, is nothing compared to the jhanas, which is niramisa, the, the absorptions you can experience doing uh, meditation. Even the first jhana uh, makes uh, any orgasm, even the most successful orgasm or drug experience, even the most uh, colorful, uh, fantastic, uh, transcendent drug experience look like a uh, injection with a rusty needle or uh, a mosquito bite. Something on that order. Huh? Uh, it's because it's something that is not of this world. It has nothing to do with this world. It has nothing to do with this body. It's a, it's a mental state in itself. And that's why we call it super mundane. There's two kinds. You can say there's if jhanas is something that you do when you meditate. And then there's another super mundane joy, which is something a stream entrance. There is a person who has become noble, which has become 25% enlightened, that they experience as a fruit. We call it a fruit. There's a maka moment when he or she enters this state, which is a safe state. They cannot be reborn as a, a, a lower than a human. They cannot be reborn as an animal. They have only seven lives left. So very, they are very close to Nibbana. They experience as a fruit, falla, some special joy. This joy is not of this world. It makes them laugh. P uh, people usually, when they see a noble laugh, they don't realize that this person is a noble, but they have difficulties with understanding why this person is laughing. They have difficulties with understanding why this person is happy. And this is because this person is happy and experiencing a joy that is not of this world. So they have no access to it. They don't understand why this. They don't experience it. They have never experienced it in their entire behavior, their entire uh, samsaric career, neither in this life nor in any further prior life. Never have they experienced it. So they don't know what's going on. They cannot kind of like, is he crazy? Is she crazy? What, what's going on? But they can see that this person is very happy on a subtle level. It's a very kind of like refined joy. Yes, refined is the best word. Subtle, uh, sublime. And often connected with uh, this person looking back on uh, being uh, running around like a pig uh, after the carrot in a, in a, a prior state of, in the non-noble state which is noble has been in before then looking better at these issues it looks so comic uh, and so mundane and so primitive and so it, it, it comes to be funny it experienced as funny for the noble but not for the non-noble there is still also issues ah, but it's not comic when uh, I sit in front of my computer screen masturbating. Uh, that's not comic. That's not pig-like behavior. No, that is adult entertainment. That's the excuse I use for my... Or when I take drugs, or uh, when I do something other primitive. It's not, it's not something primitive, really, because it's necessary. It's necessary for me to do. And, and this, <laughs> these excuses, these bad excuses, the noble don't buy, huh? because they know how it is. So they, they, why they know? Because they have used these excuses themselves before. One 
billions of billions of her time. So they recognize right away, clock a uh, bad excuse. This person is addicted, is craving, is clinging to some particular kind of pleasure, and thereby will invent whatever, even completely unreasonable defense in order to defend his own uh, self-destructive behavior because it gives him or her pleasure, sense pleasure, pleasure of the flesh, samiza, pleasures of this world. So usually people say these pleasures of this world are innocent, but that's not the case. Uh, that's a wrong notion because all wars, uh, whether economical wars or political wars, uh, all fights, uh, mother had with daughter, fa father had with son, director with director, policeman with head with policeman, soldier with soldier. Everybody's fighting everybody because of one thing, sense pleasure. They want sense pleasure. And if they don't get that junk, they'll fight and kill. So that has to be seen as this. It's not uh, only juice. Ice cream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. Ice cream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. What happens if you don't get the ice cream? Huh? Then the knife comes out. Uh, because somebody else has this ice cream. And there the conflict starts. There the harming starts. There the war starts. So sense pleasure is by no means of that word innocent or ineffective or insignificant in any regard. It starts wars. It's an addictive behavior. How can it be overcome? How can you transcend it? You can only transcend it by experiencing a higher pleasure than that. Then you transcend it automatically because you're always looking for the highest pleasure you, ha you have ever experienced. You'll come back to that. Mind will come back, see, keep scanning. And whether it's a sexual pleasure or it's a, a drug-related uh, pleasure or whatever, something to to do with computer gaming or entertainment or can be anything, music, dancing. Then the mind will come back to this moment where it experienced some high level of pleasure. And then it will try to, try to regenerate that particular moment, these particular surrounding circumstances, to re-experience that pleasure again. And it will keep doing that until it dies or until it kills itself doesn't matter. This craving for sense pleasure is higher than the craving for self-preservation. Just see this uh, morphinist, for example. They keep injecting for morphine into themselves even though they're killing themselves. The smoker is keep smoking even though he, he knows he's killing himself. Slowly, he doesn't stop smoking. So it's something that makes people kill themselves, sense pleasure. So it's a, it's a, it's a tough one. And what, friends, are these simple joys of the flesh? There are these five strings of sin pleasure. What five? Visible forms experienceable by an eye. Smellable odors experienceable by the nose. Tasteable flavors experienceable by the tongue. Touchable objects experienceable by the body. All are attractive, captivating, desirable, irresistible, lovely, agreeable, tempting, pleasing, sensually interesting, seductive, alluring, and tantalizing. These are the five strings of sense pleasure. Joy that arises from these five strings of sense pleasure, this is simply the joy of the flesh. So said the Buddha. And what, friends, is then the joy not of this world, not of this flesh? Aloof, and above any lust, quite secluded from any sense pleasure, protected from any disadvantageous mental state, one enters and dwells in the first jhana, in the first mental absorption, full of joy and pleasure, born of secluded solitude, joined with directed and sustained thought. With the stilling of this directed and sustained thought, one later enters and dwells in the second jhana of calmed assurance 
and unification of mind, devoid of any thought and thinking, joined with joy and pleasure, now born of concentration. These are called the joys, not of this world. And what, friends, is the joy that is beyond that joy, which is not of this world? It is when a bhikkhu, a monk, or a disciple, a lay disciple, whose mental fermentations are eliminated, then he reviews, looks back on his mind, which is liberated from all lust. It's freed from all hatred. And it's released from all confusion. Right there when he looks back at this mind, there arises a transcendental joy. This is a bliss that is quite beyond that joy that is not of this world. It's from the Samyutta Nikaya, book number four, section 36, Unfeeling Vedana, Joys of this World. Then there was also a question about these levels of this joy. Can it be leveled in any, described in any kind of level? And yes, it can. It's a classic description. It's a five level description. There's minor joy. They, they can raise a hair on the body when you're really thrilled. Uh, then there's momentary joy, which flashes forth on various occasions, comes just like that, and you become very happy for a short time. Then there's showering joy, which breaks over the body like sea waves. It's coming again and again and again and again. Then there's uplifting joy, which can be strong enough to elevate the body up into the air. Uplifting joy, which can elevate the body up into the air. And then there's pervading boy, joy, which is like a heavy sponge, saturated with water. The elevating joy, I'll just tell a classic story about from the commentaries. It was a family up in Anuradhapura, the holy city, uh, approximately 150 kilometers from where I am now, on Sri Lanka. You can still go there yourself. There's some stupas. There's, uh, among those, there's one who's called the Mahastuba, and it's fairly large. Maha means big. Uh, it's a round structure uh, where there's some of Buddhist relics inside. And in uh, something in, in the fourth century uh, after uh, uh, our era, uh, there was a family living up there in this, in this village close to these uh, stupas. And then at that time, the, then at the holy days here, uh, every full moon night, they will meet uh, around this stupa, both the monks and the nuns and the lay people male and female, they will be there. The lay people will be in white clothes, the monks and nuns will be in their robes, and then the monks will go uh, right side in one row around the stupa. It has a circumference of approximately something like 150 meters, 175 meters, so you can be probably two, two or 400 people in one row, something like that, maybe 300. So you walk around 300 people right after each other, the monks would walk right uh, clockwise inside. Then the nuns would walk, walk next outside uh, anti-clockwise. Then the male followers would walk clock clockwise with having it on the right side uh, in the next row outside. And then the uh, female lay followers then will walk anti-clockwise uh, outside. And if there's more than one row, you can have more than one row of each uh, if there's many. And this is, you're going around, you usually have candle in your hand you're going around and while you're reciting and the monks they are chanting one sutta one particular speech of the buddha in pali and then you usually get a very uh, devout feeling in your heart because there's just so many people who have so uh, great respect for the buddha the dhamma and the sangha and you also have it so you are kind of like touched in the same way that christians are touched inside the church and you get what the hindus call bhakti which is basically devotion, spiritual devotion. Very pleasant uh, state, mental state. Very advantageous also. And then there was in this, uh, while they were doing this, uh, uh, one day in the afternoon of, of this full moon night, and everybody will do this, uh, they were looking forward to it. 
then there was a pregnant young woman but then her parents said to you you're pregnant you cannot go there because there's a lot of people a lot of bus and you're heavily heavily pregnant so you stay in the house we go but you stay here because you are so extremely pregnant what happens if you if somebody uh, puffs to you and there's a lot of bus there then you might will give birth right there uh, we, while we are going around the stupa so you stay at the house we go and, and she was not much for that because she was a very devout buddhist then uh, her parents went there and they were she was living not far from it and actually she could see the candlelights and she could hear the chanting the singing from the stupid why they were going around and then she felt a great joy a very great joy over hearing this that now it, they have started and she they have, she had participated many times in this uh, particular ritual herself so she was felt an ex an extraordinary amount of joy and this joy elevated her up into the body uh, up into the air and flew her right to the stupa and put her down where her parents sent, suddenly seeing her there ask what happened and then she, she explained what happened this is one of these stories where you can get a sense of what joy level four joy elevating joy can do and what to speak of what pervading joy level five joy can do spiritual joy the delight in devotion bhakti anyone convinced by understanding of the buddha dhamma and sangha gets an enthusiastic sense of the sublime good goal of nibbana and then thus gains the gladness connected joined and fused with this supreme dhamma in anyone gladdened joy is born the body of one who is joyous is calm because he is satisfied one of calm body experiences pleasure and happiness sukha the mind of one who is happy becomes concentrated why is that so because mind is looking for happiness when it has already find it then it doesn't need to look doesn't need to scan anymore after happiness and it comes down then it becomes concentrated the concentrated mind sees and knows things as they really are this produced produces disgust and disillusion which enables full direct experience of mental release without any clinging it is in this way that joy indeed is a factor leading to enlightenment so the joy itself gradually leads to concentration which then leads to insight when which then leads to disgust which then leads to disillusion which then releases the clinging or the first the craving and then the clinging because what you exp- you what you are becoming disillusioned about you re- you detach from it automatically you don't want it anymore so this detachment then this detachment is in the mind can fly now it's released it doesn't hold itself to the ground anymore it's not clinging to anything heavy anymore mandiba nikaya examples of this super mundane joy a bhikkhu with his mind all quiet retired to a remote an empty place just like this there are right insight in the dhamma a what seem a superhuman super mundane delight it is because he really comprehends the rise and fall of all phenomena the emergence and the ceasing of all states whether physical or mental whether past present or future it is because he sees and knows that with his own mind with his own body that he relishes in this high happiness a silent joy not of this world not of this world 
a bliss transcending the human. And he knows it to be the deathless. Nibbana. So he knows and sees by this joy, by this insight, Nibbana, right there, right then. Dhammapada 373 and 374. Nice piece. I think this covers the joy and the sense pleasure issue. Uh, just remember one thing. There's joys of the flesh, joys connected with the world, and then there's supermundane joy, joys not of this flesh, nidamisa. And then there's a joy that goes beyond the joys not of the flesh. Then you're good to go. Question C. How to control sexual desire and craving for porn? Very relevant today. 80% of the internet traffic is porn. Uh, it's a whole industry. It's uh, basically because of mirror neurons. You have neurons inside your brain. It has been a very fancy uh, subject of uh, neurology research for the last 20 years. It was discovered by somebody who was making experiments on macaque monkeys, which has electrodes implanted in the pleasure center, the reward center. And uh, the electrodes were connected to a computer, and you could hear it clicking when the, uh, re the reward center neurons were firing. Then they were feeding one monkey uh, peanuts, and then y you could see the, uh, this pleasure center neurons they were firing. Click, 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 click. click. Then they stopped making experiments on monkey B or monkey A. Then there was a monkey B. Then they, they forgot to disconnect monkey A. They start making experiments on monkey B. Then they make it a very important observation. When they fed monkey B, monkey A's pleasure neurons also start clicking. So monkey B, you give him uh, peanuts, then his pleasure center, his reward center starts clicking. But monkey A, which didn't get any peanuts, his pleasure center also starts clicking because he sees monkey B, his neighbor, getting the peanuts. So it's hardwired into our mind that we get pleasure when we see something, uh, some others do something, eat or having sex or whatever, that we also uh, feel pleasure with. So we get kind of like a kick when they get a kick. And that's, uh, there has been a lot of speculation why you actually have such neuron. And it has something to do with social coherence in a group of group animals. That they be tend to behave, uh, if they can feel each other that, like that, then they, they tend to behave like a group. Uh, and uh, that can be mutually advantageous in a Darwinistic sense. But that's only speculation. But uh, the, the, the fact of the mirror neuron's existence is really a scientific fact. That's for sure. Because it's hardwired in your mind, and it's very difficult not to feel pleasure if you see a pornographic picture where it's assumed that the other one feels pleasure. Very difficult not to feel pleasure because it's hardwired by mirror neurons into your brain. And this causes addictive uh, behavior uh, of pornomania which is uh, sweeping over the planet like a lava, and which is so primitive, so it is so disgusting, so coming. Uh, I usually use uh, this uh, simile of, imagine there were some people on, up on Mars, or on Pluto, or in another galaxy, and what they meet first from the human culture is uh, all their internet communication. And then they see uh, that 80% of it is porn. What do you think they think when they see this? And the rest is violence. It's action movies. So I think uh, humans, they, uh, they, are, they are nuts. <laughs> Don't go down there, visit them. They're crazy. They only think of two things, killing each other and having sex. And then this is, the rest is uh, drugs and uh, f uh, feed, fooding, and money, basically it. Is this somebody you want to visit? No. Huh? So 
this should be seen as it is. But it's very, very difficult to come off because it's so easy to get high-speed internet, high-quality porn. Actually, it's a, it's a problem for young males because they, they get erectile dysfunction. They cannot uh, get erection because they have seen so much high-quality porn uh, that they cannot... Uh, when they read a, meet a real girl, she never looks as good as uh, the porn stars. So they don't get any uh, sexual arousement uh, while they are with the real girl. Uh, so they cannot get erection uh, because, because of, of this pornomania. So it's starting be to become a problem, actually. Uh, you have to kind of like rebooting uh, by not watching porn for three months, then uh, the erection will come back. Ma major issue. How to cure it, actually, and how to cure any sense pleasure. It's like, it's like the, whenever you see an object, whether it's a pornographic ob object or a your favorite sexual object or a, an advertisement for food or an advertisement for music or an advertisement for whatever sense pleasure you, that you favor, then th this craving will start. There's only two outcomes. Either you satisfy, satisfy the craving or you become frustrated. There's no other outcome if you don't have any unbutton because the, off, the unbutton has been pressed by circumstances that you c came into contact with. Just remembering sex, remembering music, remembering food, the taste of food, seeing a an object, food object, seeing the refrigerator. Any ca anything can stimulate this. If there's no on on off button, then you have to satisfy this craving or become unhappy because it's not satisfied. That's why it's important to get an off button. You see the craving, then you can press the off button. Off. Just like the TV, you turn the TV on, you turn the TV off. Huh? But if you don't have any off button, how can you turn it off, the craving? So to gain the off button is done classically by one practice. It's called a super meditation. A super, super means beautiful or delightful, or, and a super means disgusting. Uh, repulsive. So uh, there's bone skeleton scanning. Uh, there's regarding own bodies, uh, others own bodies and others bodies as a bag of bones plastered with skin with nine oozing holes. And then there's the nine corpse meditations, and we will go through all of that. It is because of one basic fact: mind cannot have craving, lust, desire for something. At, and at the same time being disgusted by it. So if the disgust, then the craving goes down immediately. If you see, if you open the fridge and it's full of maggots, then you close it again, you don't want to eat anything in there because you've seen something disgusting. Same thing, uh, you're expecting there was a sexu uh, sexual attractive lady under the, under the, in the bed, then you take off the bed cover and then it shows up it's a corpse. Then you, you don't want to have sex with the corpse because it's thinking exploded, it's full of maggots. So it's because of this, if there's disgust, it's a constructive disgust. People usually react emotionally, immaturely, and prematurely emotionally on this aspect of disgust and delusion, disillusion. But it's something very, very advantageous, very, very good, very, very constructive because it can deconstruct desire craving, greed, can deconstruct all these things which are very detrimental, very disadvantageous, very fearful, very painful, very much suffering. So you use this disgust, which is not pleasant, no it's not pleasant, but you nevertheless use it as a tool to get this off button. This means that you are in a state where, oh you see, if there's desire, you turn this desire off. As simple, uh, as easy as you turn off the television. You have to recognize, of course, the first the television is on. You have to recognize your desire is on before you can turn it off. But at the moment you have realized this is on and you don't want to have to have it on, then you have the freedom of choice to turn it off if you have this off button, which is an, an image you have memorized in your mind, which is the most revolting image you can think of, of a corpse, usually. 
the most revolting image you can think of. I have this disgust uh, drops, dharma drops on my website, whatbuddhasit.net. You go there, search for disgust. I also post some links here in this talk. And then uh, there's some images there in a photo bucket uh, database. And there you just choose this corpse images. There's a password, uh, corpses. And then uh, you choose the most revolting, the most emo emotionally provocative corpse image you can find. And then you memorize it, so you never forget it. In color, you should be able to see it in color. All details with closed eyes. Then you have made, memorized it. Close enough. Whenever the greed comes back, whether it's porn green, porn, porn greed, or greed for food, or greed for entertainment, or greed for whatever, computer gaming, then you memorize, you recall this image to your mind. Then the desire goes away instantly. If it comes back, you, you turn it off again. Just like if the television goes on again automatically by itself, then you can turn it off again. Thereby, you have gained an off button, and that's really, really crucial. Otherwise, you're addicted for the rest of your life to something that you cannot control. You have no chance. The, ch the, the drug addicted person has no chance of not choosing drugs. The smoker has no chance of not choosing to smoke. It's very, very difficult. The sex addicted, porn addicted has no chance of stop having this addiction. And whether you are addicted to drugs or other kinds of sense pleasure, it doesn't matter. It's equally detrimental. Because the side effects are the same. Suffering, death, old age. So bone, skeleton scanning first. You scan your own bone while sitting meditation, and if you see somebody other other person, you scan their bones also. And you say, ah, there's a skull, there's a jaw, there's a teeth, eight here, eight here, eight here, eight here. And uh, there's a fingers, there's a bone inside this finger, here, middle, this one. Uh, there's a bone here, there's two bones here, there's one bone here, there's one bone here, there's ribs, 12 of them. Uh, there's a bone in the neck. Uh, there's a bone in the columna, there's a hip bones on both sides, uh, there's a femur bone, there's a knee bone, the knee skull, and the two bones in the underleg, the heel bone, and the bones in the feet. You just keep, whenever you see a body, whenever you think of a body, you don't think of the skin, which is usually what you fall in love with, which is cause the addiction, because you see the skin, you feel the skin. You think of the bones, you identify anything, any body you see, ah, bones. You scan the bones up and down. Labeling, like, like I just did, all the bones by name. From the tip of the skull down to the small toe. And from the small toe again back to the tip of the skull. One day when I have done this practice for a long time, I had a funny experience. I was walking on a bridge uh, inside in a Copenhagen city. Uh, was close to the main train station. There was a lot of people, very busy, uh, five or six in the evening. Very, very busy. Thousands of people. And they were dressed heavily because it was in the wintertime in Denmark. It was fairly cold. And uh, I looked up uh, under this bridge and saw all, this, all these people coming against me. And I saw only skeletons. I saw only skeletons. I didn't see actually skeletons. I don't mean visually. I didn't see them. But this was what what I say. Ah, oh, there's a lot of skeletons coming there. They are coming against me, uh, dressed up. All these skeletons. So there, I has assimilated into the, this mind of interpreting all bodies as skeletons. Another issue, another story regarding this was uh, uh, some forest monks here on this island of of Sri Lanka. Also, they had a parrot, and they were uh, reciting this. Uh, these skeletons uh, scanning all the time, and then uh, another, uh, then a crow came in into b among this forest monastery, uh, among the trees to steal some food that was left over, and then it it, it fell down to, it bumped into a tree and fell down, and then the parrot said, 
uh, bones falling down, bones falling down. So, so the parrot has also assimilated this way of looking at others' bodies as bones. Bones falling down. That's funny. Then there's a nice... Uh, so the first bone skeleton scanning, second thing regarding own and others' bodies as a bag of bones plastered with skin and nine oozing holes. Nine oozing holes. One eye, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Girls, ten. Oozing is there's something coming out of it. There's tears coming out of the eyes. There's snot coming out of the nostrils. There's earwax coming out of the ears. There's saliva and spittle uh, coming out of the mouth. There's urine coming out uh, uh, of the urinary tract. There's excrement coming out of the anal canal. And there's uh, excreta coming out of the vagina also for the girls, for the females. So they are really oozing out these holes in this skin, in this body, in this bag of bones. The nine corpse meditation are classically. Uh, there's also, I will place a link to a very, very nice uh, corpse picture I recently got. Usually here they get corpse, a monk get corpse from the government or somebody dedicate their bodies to this. Then uh, one just lay, lay the corpse on the ground and cover it uh, with uh, some fence so the animals uh, doesn't eat it or run away with it. And then you look at it for months. And usually you have to put it away, far away from uh, buildings because it's, it's, it's a strong smell connected with it. Then you look at it for half a year or until the bones are rotten and photograph it. And this has recently been done uh, and been photographed in three different stages, uh, which I will mention now. Then you memorize it, how it how it looks, and that's why where the the decoupling of the greed is coming in. So the one is memorizing a corpse one, two, or three days old, swollen, blue, and festering. B being eaten by crows, hawks, vultures, dogs, jackals, worms, and maggots. C. A skeleton with some flesh, some flesh and blood still attached to it. C. A blood besmeared skeleton, but now without flesh. A skeleton by separated E. Separated bone scattered in a mess. F. Skeleton simply as bleached while white shell-like bones. G, bare bones thrown into the cemetery, heaped up. You can see this in, in many monasteries, heaped up bones. H, stack of bones now gone rotten and turned black and going into dust. I usually, when I do last, then I imagine my own bones, my own skeleton, going through through these stages. And then when I, I visualize now that this is happening, I visualize it's happening on a stone surface, a, a rocky mountain cliff or something like that. Then there's some rotten crust, uh, dust left from the bones, and I do like, <laughs> to disembark, uh, dis detach from the rest, the, the last remnant of this body. Because if you like to stay in a body, you cannot go to Nibbana, that's for sure, because there's no, no bodies in Nibbana. So if you want to stay there in this prison, uh, if you don't want to stay in this prison, you have to detach from this body. This is an exercise to do that. <laughs> Get rid of the dust also. No need to keep bone dust, rotten bone dust. Huh? And that's not happiness, that's suffering. So this clever, constructive disgust, it cools all obsessive greed and addictive lust. Here are also sexual craving and porn addiction. This was originally a question asked by a young man who, also, who wants to enter the Sangha and who wants to become a monk. He also asked how long time will it take before the sexual uh, craving goes off, before you can be without sexual orgasm. And it's difficult to say actually because it's individual in each case. There's two factors up in there. 
how greedy are the person when he's starting to practice and how much does he practice if it's he's very greedy it takes a long time but even a very greedy person can reduce his time significantly by making a heavy practice who is, is in particular prone to be sexually uh, addictive it is piece a person who are, have sexual sense pleasure as the strongest uh, Greed for sense pleasure as the strongest mental refinement. They usually like to eat slowly, tasting. And they are having, uh, uh, they are very pleased with uh, all kinds of aesthetics. Uh, they walk slowly. Uh, they're not uh, not usually uh, very angry, uh, but they are very focused on getting their kicks, whether it's orgasm or whether it's drugs or whether it's food. Uh, or whether it's entertainment, they want to have this whatever that is their favorite kind of sense pleasure. They are especially prone to fall prey of this addiction, and thereby should use this disgust meditation, asubha bhavana, to gain this asubha nimitta, this sign of disgust planted into their mind. And the off bottom is recollecting that very sign of disgust, which is very, very advantageous. How can you be in control if you cannot turn some, something off? It means that it, it corresponds to living in a house where there's a lot of televisions, and they go on, then they never go off. There's nobody who can turn them off because there's no off bottom, and they're continuously connected to the electricity, the, the flow of craving. I think that's enough for today because otherwise it becomes too uh, too heavy to download. So I think uh, I'll just put up a little more light here. And then we'll take the last intro. Thank you for your attention. Namo. Tasso. Bhagavattu. Arahatto, Samma Sambuddhasa, worthy, honorable, and perfectly self enlightened is the best Buddha. Remember to click subscribe. Uh, see, down there, <laughs> probably. <laughs> click subscribe, and uh, then you'll get this once a week. Then you'll become a good Buddhist before you die. I assure you. Thank you for your attention.